Okay. Hello all. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you for joining this session on Azure SQL Database and API integration, a pathway for event-driven frameworks. Now, before we move into this topic, I'd like to provide a brief introduction about myself. So I'm Nandan Hegde. So I I'm working as a data architect at Accenture for Evernote organization. I am a recent Microsoft Data MVP, a C Sharp Corner MVP, and have been a Microsoft Data Community Champion since past two years. I like writing blogs on Azure data products, and this is my blog site. And you all can reach out to me on Twitter and on LinkedIn via my profiles. Now let's move on to the major aspect. That is the external REST endpoint. A couple of months back. Microsoft announced the general availability of a feature in Azure SQL database called the external REST endpoint. Now that leads or opens a gateway for multiple aspects. Now what it does is it allows the ability to call the REST endpoints from Azure SQL database, thereby creating a medium or an integration with other services or products. Within Azure SQL Database. Now it's this toad procedure, the SP underscore invoke underscore external underscore REST underscore endpoint. I know a pretty large name for a toad procedure, correct? But it does follow the Microsoft naming standards. Now it's via the single toad procedure, one can call REST or graph service endpoints in Azure directly within Azure SQL databases. Pretty cool, correct? Now one might be wondering, does it allow direct connectivity to all endpoints? So the answer to that is no. Basically, a restricted or a certain amount of REST services are supported directly within the Azure SQL database. Those include Azure Functions, Logic Apps, Power BI Analysis Services, Azure Blob Storage, Cognitive Services, Event Hub, and some more. If that is, if these are the only ones that are supported, then how to invoke a REST service that is not allowed? Now, one can use the Azure API management to securely expose the service or the REST service that is not supported and make it available to the database as Azure API management is supported as a REST endpoint. If not, since Azure function is supported via Azure function, can act as a bridge to call other REST endpoints. Pretty cool, correct? Now, calling REST endpoints, there might be some security concerns with respect to this functionality, correct? So to handle to that aspect, let's move on to the security aspects of this functionality or feature before we move on to the actual use cases. Now, to call an endpoint, we need to specify the authorization token if the token endpoint is private, correct? Now for that, we can create database scope credentials within the Azure SQL database to store securely your authorizations. Now, there are three authentications that are supported. One is the HTTP endpoint headers via passing the request headers, endpoint query string, wherein you pass the entire query string of the REST endpoint or the managed identity. We would be covering two of this in the demo aspect. Now it's not just that a specific role has been created within the database to allow execution of the stored procedure. So one requires a role in the database and that role is to execute any external endpoint database permission. Thereby making it a secure aspect to trigger any APIs within the Azure SQL database. Now let's move on to the use cases. The first use case is the data virtualization or the data enrichment. Now, unlike Synapse Data Warehouse or SQL Server 2022, wherein we have the polybase functionality in external tables, Azure SQL Database as of now does not support that. You have to physically load the data while reading the data from blobs or via open row set. Now, since Azure Blob Storage is supported, you can use the REST API of Azure Blob Storage to read the file and get the data 
in a virtual mode itself without actually loading the data or you can query or get data from other api services to enrich your existing data set now to activate workflow unlike the sql server on premises or is or even sql mi wherein we do have database email notification aspect or sql server agent up till now azure sql database we could not directly send any live notification etc but with this aspect since logic app is one of the supported aspect one can trigger the workflows via logic app to send instant notifications and coming to the major aspect that is event driven architecture now in today's world latency in today's data and analytics world lower the latency more is the beneficial architecture for that so with the combination of database trigger and the rest api endpoint aspect this can lead to multiple event driven frameworks some of which will fo follow in a demo aspect so now moving to the demos now let's cover the first aspect that is authentication aspect now there were three authentications that we discussed but some of the endpoints which are public accessible like in this case i have created a logic app for sending an email notification which is publicly accessible so in this case i just need to provide the url and the post method which i need to execute it so once i execute this it returns a status that it is a success aspect and in case if i check my email notification aspect i received an email just now that this is a demo rest endpoint demo. now this can be useful in the cases whenever there are any significant changes or we can enable system driven triggers within the database and any change in any schemas we can send a notification to the users now let's go to an event driven framework that is power bi since most of the scenario is we integrate power bi with azure sql database in an import functionality so rather than the system being in silos it is efficient that the report gets refreshed instantly when the data becomes available within the system so for that i have created a trigger on to this table in case of insert scenario wherein i am triggering the data flow refresh rest api and for that i am using the managed identity authentication wherein i have enabled the managed identity on the azure sql server and have provided it the necessary permissions on the database so in this case once i insert something a backend trigger gets initiated and that trigger internally goes and triggers the rest api to refresh the data flow in this case so this leads to mini reducing the amount of time between two systems to avoid the latency amongst those two and as you can see once the data got inserted into the table a trigger got refreshed for the data flow refresh and similarly let's take another scenario wherein since azure data fact is the major data integration tool correct in this case we would be triggering a azure function which in turn would be calling a data factory as data factory is not directly supported within the azure sql database aspect so in this case this rest endpoint is now triggering a azure function which in turn would be triggering an azure data factory and it would return an output once the azure function has successfully or synchronously returned a success or a failure status and as you can see it was a success status and we can go and verify the azure data factory logs with respect to the azure data factory being executed so now if i refresh this we can see that the azure data factory got executed now 
and finally on the closing aspect it is the get data aspect up till now we have discussed about event driven and workflow now with respect to the data enrichment aspect as we all know that power bi has a rest api to execute queries and to get the data so in this case i'm connecting to a power bi data set and i'll be executing the get data aspect and from sorry so here we are hitting the database and getting the data within the power bi data set hence it's your 10 minutes yes so on the closing point this functionality of rest endpoint allows multiple architectural aspects opens gateway for multiple aspects thank you all thank you nanda great session and with the you know, wasting no time, I hand over to Katrin. Thank you. Hopefully okay. you can see my screen. We see your screen. Right. OK, then let's start. Um, yes, my session is about a fabric, one platform to rule them all. And uh, first, I would like to give, a, give you a brief introduction. Yeah but very brief. So um, my name is uh, Catherine and I'm working at Rife as a lead consultant for BI and analytics. And if you want, you can follow me on LinkedIn. Um, I have also a YouTube channel and a website and many more things, also a TikTok channel. So if you want, join me. And I guess with this, we will uh, dive into the realm uh, of tech. So a mighty hall where data flows and numbers crawl, a platform strong, both big and small, one to rule them all. It's Fabric's call, Microsoft Fabric's call. Power BI shines like a wizard spell. With visuals and data, it does excel. Azure's cloud, a digital sprawl, and Synapse power, they stand tall. Together, they unite and stand so grand, on one leg, they take their stand. A data kingdom at their back and call to rule the realm, they top them all. So in the world of data, large and small, these services stand, we stand all. One platform to rule them all, we see, with Power BI, Azure, Synapse on one leg, it's the key. So and now, after this ballad of Microsoft Fabric, let me show uh, the service. <laughs> so uh, don't be confused. Um, in summary, um, we have in Microsoft Fabric Azure, like Azure Data Factory, Azure Data Lake Storage, Event Stream Purview, Purview, and we have also Synapse, very much of Synapse, like the dedicated SQL, serverless SQL, Spark, Notebook, Synapse, ML, and Data Explorer. And on top, we have Power BI. And all is a fabric. Uh, fabric is a base, uh, yeah, software as a service solution. And for this, I have also a small slide in which you can see the artifacts uh, in Microsoft Fabric services or Power BI service. Um, so we have uh, the data factory, uh, we have data engineering, and we have the data science area, also data warehouse and real time analytics. And of course, Power BI is very, very big area, right? So we have the elements there for the data, like the data sets, data flows, deployment pipelines, and so on. And we have also the elements for the visualization, like report, paginated reports, scorecards, dashboard, and so on. And now let's jump into a small demo I prepared. Uh, so we have five minutes, four minutes left. <laughs> and here first, if you don't have fabric now you have first to activate it and for this you need an admin so power bi admin slash fabric administrator and you find it in the admin portal and it's the first item you can see here a uh, user can create fabric items so if you don't want uh, to spread it all over your company you can uh, very easy create security groups in uh, entra or aka uh, Azure Active Directory. Um, so 
if you have a specific security group, you can put it in here and then only the people in this group can see um, yeah, Microsoft Fabric. And um, if you have Microsoft Fabric, you can easily start uh, with the button uh, at the it was the button at the bottom <laughs> and you see here Microsoft Fabric. Um, you can um, go directly over the link. Um, yes, above here or you can uh, guide through the power um, yeah, app.powerbi.com page and you see here the different areas. So we have Power BI, we have the data factory, the data activator, so and so on. So the newest thing, which is, uh, I guess, uh, now very good to use is the data activator, which which was a long time in, in preview with only cards for triggering. Now you can also use other visuals. Um, then you have uh, Power BI, of course, with all the elements you already know. And the very important thing here is uh, to say before my time's up is that uh, Microsoft Fabric is still in preview, so please don't use it in production. You can test things, um, you can work with it, uh, but uh, please don't do it in production. So if you use Power BI at the moment, this is totally okay if you use the elements we already had in production, but not the new things. So because um, it can change every day, right? So if the uh, development team, the CAD team says, okay, we don't need this one, then uh, your report or whatever you have, your notebook doesn't work anymore. So that's why it's important. You know that it's still in preview uh, and you don't have to use it in production. And yes, uh, I guess with this line, I, I will end my, my presentation. Um, let me show my last slide. Uh, so I really don't have much content here. It, it should be only a brief overview, overview uh, about Power BI. Microsoft Fabric. So yes, thanks for your attention and be the magic of Microsoft Fabric be with you all the time. <laughs> that is a lot of content in. Do, do you know how much time you use, Katrin? Um, nine minutes. Six. Six. Yes. <laughs> so if anyone has questions, we even have yes. time for questions. <laughs> Please unmute yourself if you want, so if you have questions. And yes, I will put the poem uh, on LinkedIn, so uh, if you want it, you can have oh, <laughs> I will totally share it. <laughs> uh, in the meantime, while we wait for, for the next, uh, it's two minutes or one and a half minutes to the next session, uh, I hope I... I promoted Milos to presenter and I hope it's the right Milos because it only says Milos and not the last name. So Milos, is it you who, who I presented to made a presenter? I, I see you unmuted, but I don't hear you speak. This is exciting. Uh, we will figure it out, I think. Uh, in the meantime, because Milos is up last of the uh, the lightning talk, so no rush, no rush. Uh, next speaker is uh, Giovanni Hernandez. And uh, what he's going to talk about, he will present it. Can change my headphones now? Can you hear me? Now we Not hear yet. Milos. Perfect. <laughs> OK, but there should be 1210, right? Or? Yeah, yeah, no worries. I just promote okay, you just promote me for later. Okay, oh, fine. Yeah, so I got it. So Thank that you. You're ready to go when it's your time. Okay, okay, and it's a good thing. So I had to change my my headphones, so everything fine. Thank you. Cool. Now then I go to mute there. back. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Catherine, and welcome, Giovanni. Uh, your 10 minutes will start as soon as you have started sharing your screen, I guess. If you have a screen share, or will you do without the presentation? Okay, I think that I am on time. Let me start. Okay, first of all, uh, thank everyone for attending my session. For me, it's an honor to be here. Uh, and a great uh, thank to the Data Web Kinder organizer for promoting this amazing event. So, my name is Giovanni Hernandez. Uh, I am the data engineer in a language service provider company called LanguageWare. And professionally, I have been working for more than 15 years 
in the marvelous IT world. And I have been dedicated with the last 10 years of my career in different roles, such as SQL Server Developer, Database Engineer, and Data Engineer. So the main purpose of this uh, short session or short presentation is to share part of my experience doing the transition from a database engineer role to a data engineer. I remember some years ago that I had the opportunity to start thinking in doing this kind of career change. And I received very amazing uh, advices from different professional and part of the intention of this session is try to share with you some of this advice. So probably um, you can ask, okay, Gio, what is the real difference between database engineer and data engineer? There is not a formal definition uh, about what are the kind of of task or role that a DB engineer or data engineer has to do. But in reality, it will depend in many aspects about the side of your company or the focus of your company. But in general, I would like to share uh, some general information. So for example, in the case of database engineer and data engineer, both share similarity because, I mean, they have to work with data. However, they differ in the focus and responsibility. A database engineer traditionally is more specialized in designing, optimizing, and managing the structure and performance of databases, ensuring data consistency. Here you can, you can see a group of very common tasks that are proper of database engineer. On the other hand, a data engineer is more focused in developing end-to-end -end data pipeline. It includes the ingestion, transformation, and store uh, of this kind of, of data, and they have to deal with a wide range of uh, big data technology. And you can see this kind of very common tasks that are proper of data engineer. But as I told you at the beginning, not necessarily uh, need to be 100% sure all only all these tasks. For example, I have been participating in some uh, project where the database engineer has to do uh, the data modeling. That is, is very common too. However, if you ask me which was my motivation for becoming data engineer, the reality that after participate in two data engineering projects, I decide to, okay, you know, I really like this kind of, of task proper of data engineer. I remember that the first project was focused in building a data warehouse from scratch. So I had a really amazing mentor who helped me a lot to understand very specific aspect about uh, business intelligence and data warehouse, including Kimball uh, methodology and this kind of concept. And the second project was more focused, this is the storytelling part, <laughs> and the second was more focused in a process for clean archiving and clean up big MySQL database. At, at that project specifically, I had to deal with Python and other kind of technology. So I remember that when I finished this second project, I decided to do a kind of transition. But normally the transition are not trivial in terms that you cannot expect that today I am DB engineer and tomorrow I will be a data engineer. No, you need to plan. But the good part about planning is that you can split the process, at least from my perspective, into very special part. The first is identify the skill and knowledge transfer. Why? Because in this case, uh, imagine that you are moving, you are changing from, from one street to another street, but still you are living in the same neighborhood. Because in reality, you have to deal with data and with many aspects that probably you know. So if you are a database engineer, Traditionally, as a database engineer, you are a strong problem solver, detail-oriented, and you have to know how to communicate complex idea. All this kind of uh, knowledge and sub skill will be useful in the data engineer uh, role too. In terms of technology, I mean, every knowledge that you have from database engineer probably could be more or less uh, useful in data engineer. But for me, the most important are, or the most relevant technical knowledge that you can transfer to the new role as data engineer is mainly SQL, a structured query language, because if the lingua franca, 
that is applied for any role related with data, including data architect, including uh, data analyst, uh, database engineer, and data engineer, of course. So if you have a master in, in this in this link, uh, programming language, you are very, very well prepared uh, for advancing in this direction. And additionally, uh, the knowledge about cloud is extremely important. So having this is some kind of asset that you can perfectly transfer to the new role. But I have to be honest, we need to uh, fill a gap because independently of your good solid knowledge about database, you still need to learn many different technology. So my main advice in this part is simple. Do a market research, evaluate which are the most demanding uh, technical skill and soft skill, and try to classify, group, and prepare, and rank this uh, skill. In my personal experience, for example, programming language, I remember to review the market demand, the job offer, and Python is the programming language number one. Uh, from, from that point in advance, you can find different kind of technology, but remember, it's not only about technology. You need to start learning the fundamental. For example, what exactly means stream processing, batch processing, this kind of, of solid concept it's extremely important that you understand because the technology is something that you can perfectly uh, learn with past, with, with, with time and passion, but you need to have solid fundamentals. One that you have complete this is the, the most interesting part, online courses, resources, and building a portfolio. Okay, my main advice here is simple. Please remember your education is valuable, spend time and money. Uh, try to avoid the kind of bootcamp or course that promise you, hey, you will learn five technology in three months. Traditionally, the reason is scam. Don't be fooled in this aspect. Spend money and planify and planning correctly your time. Uh, if you are like me, that I still read physical book, uh, try to locate the best author in this topic and advance. Remember, is a process, it's a marathon, it's not as a spring. And finally, building a portfolio, because when you are moving from one role to another role, probably you will start as a junior, which is normal. And don't don't be afraid about it. You are, If you are a master in your area, and but you decide to go ahead in another uh, position, in another role, remember, we have to learn. Learn is everything about our profession. So networking and mentoring. Remember, like Data Weekend and other event, if you can share it with other, you are able to learn from other. So networking is extremely important. We are, we are part of a community. So probably the same problem that you are having right now is a problem that other people solved in the past or uh, reverse and mentoring. If you don't have a mentor, which is very common, try to think in this way you can become a mentor for order. Finally, overcoming challenge. Especially if you are a master in your area, you will you will experiment some, um, some darkness time. Please be brave. Remember which was your main motivation for doing this change. Go ahead. If you fail, don't worry. Continue and continue. Repeat and repeat. At the end of the story, if you are become, if, if if you are coming from a DTV, D database engineer or DBA role, I mean you are used to deal with very very uh, strong problem and you overcome. So you will do it. Finally, your motivation is extremely important. Remember, with passions and passion for learning is the key. Don't worry and go ahead because data engineering is a marvelous world too. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for presenting. Uh, 9, 59, 10, perfect timing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Pleasure, bye-bye. Uh, I see Charles on uh, camera already. Welcome. Yeah.
Are you ready? I think so. I'll share my PowerPoint. Dataverse brick walls. The stage is yours, Charles. Great. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. My name is Charles Sexton. You can also call me Charlie. I'm a Power Platform Solutions Architect working for Bridgeall, which is a Microsoft partner based in Glasgow, Scotland. And I have a lot to talk to you about today, so I'll try and go through it as quickly as possible, but also make sure it's very understandable. So what I'm going to try to do here is uh, highlight the issues that I have found when I've been approaching Dataverse from a SQL background or a Procode background and how I tackled those problems. So the first thing to be aware of is that Dataverse is not just a database. It's part of Power Platform and it offers a lot of integration with all parts of Power Platform. And you've got a number of configuration options that you don't get with a SQL database. So um, what we're looking at here is a, a table within Dataverse. And once you've created your tables or your models, you can actually generate a model-driven app um, pretty much instantly. And within that app, you have full CRUD functionality. You have filtering, searching, importing and exporting with Excel. It's very powerful. So with Dataverse, it offers lots of additional features. One of those is that security is built in. You have some standard security roles that you've already got as default, and you can create very complex security scenarios. So Dataverse comes with uh, the common data model, which is a set of standard tables to help you speed up development. And um, if you utilize these tables, you're also potentially offering integration with existing apps. And these tables are used by Dynamics 365. Dynamics 365 are model-driven apps. So uh, Dataverse is built on Microsoft Azure SQL, so it is SQL in the back end. Um, but we can't use the SQL in our low-code apps. There's a great Windows application called XRM Toolbox, and in that there's a tool called SQL for CDS, which is what you can see on the left-hand side. And using that, you can actually query your Dataverse data. But again, I'll reiterate, you can't query your Dataverse data using a low-code app with SQL. Um, you can also use uh, SQL Server Management Studio to perform queries. That's in preview at the moment. And finally, the main screenshot that you can see is where we are given the are going to be given the ability to perform SQL queries in the Maker portal. This is in um, coming soon, and this will be make.parapps.com where you'll be able to do this. But of course, can't do it in your apps yet. So another thing that Dataverse can offer for us are special column types. Um, on the left-hand side there, you can see that there are calculated columns, which is where you can automate mathematical or date calculations. We've got roll-up columns, which is where we can aggregate data. Um, that refreshes every 12 hours, or you can trigger the refresh manually. So just be aware that if your data isn't there yet, that could be the reason why. And um, something that's coming through soon, which is in preview at the moment, is the screenshots on the right-hand side, which is formula columns. It's essentially a more powerful calculated column. And within formula columns, you can use PowerFX. So it's very cool. Um, another feature that's coming uh, that uh, is in the background of things really is low-code plugins. So that's the ability to write PowerFX code for a plugin that can be triggered synchronously. So rather than using Power Automate, you can trigger a synchronous uh, workflow quickly and easily. So coming from a SQL perspective, you'll see views and you might think that it's a SQL view, but a SQL view is not the same as a Dataverse view. A SQL view is a virtual table where the contents are defined by a query, but a Dataverse view is how a list of records is going to be displayed in a model-driven app. Um, so that's what you see in front of you here, where you can add and remove columns, you can resize the columns, and on the right-hand side, you can sort them and you can filter them. Now, you can use views in a Canvas app. A Canvas app is where you're given a blank canvas and you create the interface for your app. You also decide what queries you want to perform to your data sources. Um, but if you use a view in a Canvas app, it will only take into account the sorting and the filtering. It won't take into account what columns you've selected. So bear that in mind. So once you've created your Dataverse tables, once you've built everything you want to build, 
you need that to be contained within a solution in order to perform application lifecycle management. Basically, a solution is a, a package for everything. It's your, your container. You put your tables in there, you put your apps in there, Power Automate flows. It all can also contains your security roles, your environment variables, those kinds of things. You package them up, you publish it, and then you can export it from your development environment and import it into test and production. One thing to be aware of, though, is that you won't be moving your data across when you do that. If you want to move your data versus data across, you'll need to do that separately. And Microsoft provide a tool called the Configuration Migration Tool, which is what you see a screenshot of here. Essentially, you create a schema, so you choose your tables, you choose your columns, and then you will be able to export your data. And it will create a zip file that will contain XML files, and that will have the schema within it as well as the data. So when we're going back to talking about Canvas apps, um, when you start creating more complex relationships inside of Canvas apps using Dataverse, you'll get this error message every so often. And this will be because you're trying to dig too deep into those relationships and it just can't cope with it. So in SQL, you'd be performing some joins or you'd be performing nested queries, that kind of thing. You can't do anything like that in a Canvas app, of course, you're using PowerFX code. So what you need to do instead is table shaping. So essentially you get your table, you'll add a column to it, and that column that you're adding is where you'll perform another query. And in Parabs, ParaFX, that's called a lookup, or it could be a filter. So lookup if you want one record, or a filter if you want multiple records. So because of these kinds of issues, normalization is less of a, a thing within Dataverse. Data duplication is not necessarily a taboo subject. Um, you might want to actually duplicate your data and you can keep it synchronized through a variety of different methods. Which brings me on to the next point, which is really important. We're in a low code platform, so test your ideas. Um, the speed of development is very high. You've got the opportunity to create multiple minimum viable products and see which one works best for you. Pick the best idea rather than choosing one channel to go through and finding out later on that you've got problems with it. So consider what's going to interact with data first and how it's going to access that data. And going back to querying that data from Canvas apps, um, I had this issue to do with removing duplicates. Um, I tried to do it a SQL way, which is where I selected all of my records and I said, I want everything that's not in this particular array. And uh, the Canvas app had a problem with that. It told me that there was a delegation issue. Essentially, the data source, which was Dataverse, couldn't cope with what I was asking it to do, and it would give me all of the records, and then my Canvas app would have to process them. By default, that would be 500 records. You can up that limit to 2,000, but that is the limit. So you really don't want to allow any delegation issues. You want your data source to do the processing. And the way to guess around that is, again, with table shaping. So essentially, I got my table and I added a column and that column that I added was where I checked to see if it was a duplicate or not. So I was checking to see whether it was one, three or five. And if it wasn't one, three or five, then I was allowing it through with my filter query. So it's rethinking the way that you perform queries and using table shaping instead of thinking the SQL way. And my final point is to do with choices. So choices in Dataverse are essentially an enum equivalent, um, but instead of just being a list, they are key value pairs. Um, but of course, confusingly, they're called values and labels. So you have to get your head around that as well. So you'd think that if you wanted to sort by your choices, you just wrap it in a sort function. There we go, there's my fave food. But hang on, it's not sorted properly. And that's because it's sorting by the value. So you have to use some parafex trickery in order to get what you actually want. What you have to do is you wrap your choices in a choices function, which allows you to get the value. And confusingly, the value is the label. So that's the text. But then you need to cast that to text so that the parafex or Canvas app understands what it's supposed to be doing. And when you've casted that to text, you'll finally be able to sort your choices alphabetically. So that can be something that can be quite tricky that comes up when you're trying to do that. And that was my very, very quick introduction into all the different, a few of the different blockers that I've had when thinking from a SQL perspective with Dataverse. Um, feel free to connect with me. The QR code takes you to my LinkedIn profile. And thank you very much to uh, Data Weekender for hosting this. Thank you all for watching as well. And thank you for presenting. And uh, time Thanks, management, Magnus. perfect, 9.25. Excellent. Uh,
There, I mean, there, there are always questions, but uh, well, time is up. So, <laughs> <laughs> but not yeah, feel free to contact me separately. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if if you have follow up questions to to Charles or Char Charlie or any of the other speakers, then you have their contact details, I guess. So just poke them on LinkedIn or X or Blue Sky or whatever social media you use. Thank you. Good luck, Milan. Milos. Thank you. Thank you. For I'm going to share my screen now. Yes, please do. So you see my presentation? I see it. So I'm stalking. Excellent. The Thank you very much. And welcome to the session about five common database this time mistakes. We have only 10 minutes. I will start immediately with this presentation. And the first mistake and biggest mistake is a time. Database design is underestimated. Everybody underestimates database design. Developers, they usually develop. Uh, make database design. There are no database designers. I know nobody who is, works works as database designer. That usually is done by developers. Developers do not have enough knowledge usually for this, and then do not invest lots in uh, database design. Uh, DBAs don't care about database design. They care about performance and servers and configurations. SQL community, how many conferences do we have? How many sessions? We have conferences with hundreds plus sessions. How many database design sessions do we have at that conferences? In best case, few of them. In many cases, zero. Database consultants care about database design, but they do not do database design consulting. They do performance consulting. As database consultant, you put optimize, optimize uh, um, option recompile, you perform, uh, you check configurations, you do some performance troubleshooting and tuning, but usually you don't have uh, tasks such database design because for this, you need to have you no know, requirements, you need to talk to people, you need to have uh, uh, this is more expensive for, for uh, companies and therefore usually that don't com doesn't come from database uh, consultants. Microsoft and other vendors do not have tools for data modeling. What is the tool that Microsoft has for data modeling? There is no tool. There was a Visio, I know, in this previous life of uh, Office 365. I don't know where it is now. And there's only uh, this, uh, what's the name, uh, database diagrams within a management studio, but this is when you have the entire uh, database design, physical database design, no tools, and people usually underestimate, just take a few minutes for a creating table. And this sounds as pathetic, you know, database design is a foundational project, but yes, it is. And usually database outlier application services, you can have database for two decades and you can every year change your framework, front end, whatever, but database remains there. And good design saves money, time and your reputation. Therefore, the first advice, take enough time. The second, let's do it later. And I refer here to agile methodology. Everybody works in agile methodology nowadays. And this is uh, agile methodology offers many people excuse not to do things properly because everybody is concentrating on their own story. We don't have time. We must deliver customer feedback. And everybody repeats this as a mantra. Also, many people don't understand what does it mean, but just, you know, we need to deliver. We just focus on this. It doesn't matter. No dependencies. And uh, Therefore, we don't have, you know, we focus on now, we do not focus on future, and therefore we have issues with scalability, we have issues with other things, and then we do this later, and there is no later in this case. The second thing is our hiding. There is no out-of-box solution for having within SQL Server and other also relational database management systems. And when there is no out-of-box solution within a system, that usually means there are no solution at all. People just don't archive data. What does it mean in many cases for many vendors, for many companies, you have, I know, 100 million plus tables. Also, you need less than 100K rows within this table. Sometimes you need to store this data, but nobody told you, uh, told you that you have to store it within the same table, but we store them in the same table because it's easier for us. We do nothing, just uh, uh, keep data growing there. And then we do backups with restores. Restore is longer, backup is longer. We need to spend more time. We need to spend more money for that. We need to index this data. Also, I just need few uh, percent or even less than 1% of data, but need to maintain these indexes and all these things. And whenever we try to make our hive, this project will be postponed because you will never get attention from business owners. You know, nobody wants to pay for our hiving and this will be postponed forever usually. 
Three, inappropriate data tap. Everybody is aware of this, and everybody think, yeah, I don't 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 make these mistakes. But you know, year 2022, Y2K bark was in Microsoft the, in early uh, in the beginning of the, um, the century, but one uh, Y2K22 bark was New Year's Eve 2022. In the first hours of uh, 2022, you could not get emails. Why? Because there is a component within a Microsoft. Uh, Outlook, uh, which deals with virus, uh, some antivirus things, and uh, somebody use for a date attribute combination of he didn't didn't use a uh, data type, regular data type, but just you know a uh, puzzle this data from year to last digits of year, then uh, month, and so on. And for for instance, 31st December was 21. Uh, two, one, one, two, three, whatever. And then what happens on January 2022? Then 21 becomes 22. And since they just puzzle this from many different things to make an integer, integer has an upper boundary is 2.147 billions. And what happens in arithmetic overflow? And then in the first hours, you could not read emails. And then they found a workaround by inventing December 33rd and such things. And then it did work somehow, but you could not search for emails. And that happened to Microsoft. So the people, you know, it's for big companies, it can happen because somebody underestimated again database design. Don't ever puzzle date, you know, from different text numbers, whatever. Use the right data tab. There are so many data tabs, date, date time, date time two, date time offset, just pick one. And this is a regular way to deal. Data type for small columns. What is the typical data type developers use for status, type, or category? It's integer, of course. An integer is very flexible data type. It allows you to have more than 4 billion different values for status. It's a very flexible thing. And of course, it's ridiculous you know, to use this. You don't need integer. You just need tiny. And tiny it has 256 values. And even you don't need all of them. And one can think, yeah, it's four bytes, one byte. It doesn't matter. But it does matter. So I have a, here uh, an example. I have a table with uh, int and date time, which are not necessary. And then change this to tiny int and date in this, the same definition of the table. Then I fill it with 10 million rows. And then at the end of the day, this table has 25% more storage and 30% uh, uh, more data pages. That means I need to load 30% more data in memory and maybe to cache, uh, to remove some execution plan or some other data from memory because I was lazy and basically choose a larger data tab, which is absolutely not necessary, just a wasting of space and wasting of memory. It's not only about the space, it's about the memory in buffer. It could be also opposite. You can underestimate data type size. This is very painful to change from int in big int into big int after, I know, 15 years of development. It's a huge thing and very expensive and danger and risk and so on. So whenever you think you might have 100 million rows, also this thing is 20 times lower than uh, upper boundary of integer, I would suggest go to big int, you know. Your company, we, buy, we require a new company. There is a merging of data, and suddenly your table will be 10 times uh, 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 larger. So therefore, when you have 100 millions, go for big int. It's the same. If you have 5K, go for int. Don't go for, for small int. Just for these kind of things, status type, so just don't overestimate. And data type changes are very expensive. When you want to change data type, you need to touch every software layer. Tables, store proc, interface, backend, front end, everything. You need to rewrite test, everything will fail. And the most important one, you need to convince product owner to do the change and they will you will never get okay because nobody wants to pay for it. Number four, no constraints. This is I saw this so many times. Go to a company, go to check constraints, nothing. Everything is possible there. An example for a column called grade or attribute called grade, note in Austrian school system. Most mostly people use integer for that and no constraints. That means you can put whatever you want there. And in Austrian school system, notes are one, two, three, four, five. Nothing else should be allowed there that could be misinterpreted, that could make problems, but you know, people don't put the check constraint. Why? 
because they use this mantra, business logic belongs to business layer. And this is one of the moronic myths in programming. I use people to try to avoid uh, responsibility for something. You have a check constraint, you pay for it, and you can limit the value at this column if nothing else. You know, there is no any excuse why to put anything else but one, two, three, four, five in a column. Uh, representing, I know, great in Austrian school system. And there is no excuse to put it, I know, in business layer, in front end layer, somewhere else. It's basically just a pure excuse. For check constraints, use them to limit values in the company. Everyone will interpret values in the same way, and this will increase data quality. All these great Power BI things and business intelligence is built on the data. If your data is, is messed, then you cannot build a great solution for that. And usually data, which is used for basis for all the solutions, is OLTP relational data. And this is basically related to database design. If something is unique, share this information with database systems. And as so many uh, heard this so many times, it's unique, but we will put it in application. And system, if SQL Server knows that this is a good thing, it will be also good for performance. Just one example, this query takes about 1.7 seconds if, if I don't put a unique constraint in the first table, which is a small, and with the second with a with constraint, it takes it's 10 times 10 times faster just because I care about database design. And the last one, too many nulls. Try to reduce number of nulls. You have issues with nulls. You have three valid logic. You have a different and potential danger interpretation of this thing and the perform uh, potential performance issues. What I have, I try to reduce number of nulls and this increase quality of my data. And I use this trick. If you cannot explain me why a column can uh, must support nulls within the 20 seconds, I just put not null. It's easy to remove not null to put not null from null, then, then opposite. Just to summarize this, do not underestimate database design, take time, and for each column, make three questions. Choose a proper data type, ensure that you constraint uh, uh, possible values, and check uh, whether this must be uh, uh, nullable. And changes are very expensive, and initial mistakes usually remains forever. I'm Ilosh, and here are my data that was session about common database design. Thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of the conference.